So I want to have this incredible conversation with you. It's a very difficult conversation for me to have and because I'm stuck between two generations. I came out of the first generation, which is church was from 8 p.m. until 4 p.m. And I'm coming into this new generation where church is about an hour or an hour and a half. I'm coming out of a generation where we were strict religiously. There were rules. There were, there's always a certain way of doing stuff. And we are now in a generation where grace is abundant and rampant. And this conversation is something that has proliferated out of the old culture into the new culture. And as a second generation preacher, I feel that it's important for me to tackle these topics and have often um, honest discussions on these conversations so we can help each other. The real question I want to ask is, do we go to hell after we have committed suicide? Do we go to hell after we have committed suicide? Firstly, this is going to be very triggering for people who have personally encountered or experienced this. And I want to give you a warning because we are talking about these issues. It's important that we have these issues. I recall a time when I was very inquisitive and I was asking questions because I've experienced some of these things. I've met people who have had some of these experiences. And so these are very sensitive and difficult conversations. So if you're not up for it, I advise you to stay away from this conversation. But if you're really interested in knowing, I want us to take an approach to this, a biblical approach to this, and I want us to look at it and, and have open conversations on it. Now, I've had a conversation about this with uh, a, a spiritual father of sorts and someone who has been a mentor to me for years. And we had a conversation about this, but we ended up in a disagreement concerning the, the conversation because of our approach to it. Now, there's an inherent problem with how we have defined suicide and, and the results of suicide. And I'm not talking about mental health. I'm not talking about all of that stuff. I want to talk first about the principle. In the Bible, there are certain principles that are core to the biblical faith that are greater and, and other principles that are smaller in principle. I'll give you an example. For example, when we talk about cornerstone content in the Christian culture, salvation is a cornerstone concept. It's something that's very important, something that we don't negotiate on. It's something that is tremendously massive because it has an effect on your soul and the, for eternity. These are things that we believe exist beyond the boundaries of what we are teaching in a moment, and yet they are bigger than certain things. So for example, I had a conversation with a friend of mine where we were talking about the role of women in the church. And he brought up a couple of scriptures in the book of Timothy, and I think it's Titus as well, where he says women, for example, must not lead, must not take positions of leadership in the church. That's a conversation for a different day. My conclusion on that conversation was, this is not a load-bearing wall. This is not something that's going to dismantle your salvation. For example, I don't foresee a time when God is going to shut down the gates of heaven and say, you can enter because you are a woman and you preach the gospel. And he's Essentially, such conversations are conversations that affect us in the realm of life, but not in the realm of eternity. It's very important that we learn to distinguish between issues that are given, even in the Bible, issues that are of greater importance and issues that are of lesser importance. Why is this conversation important? Because uh, a lot of people don't understand how to apply principle. There are certain things that have no power to nullify your salvation, but certain things that are needed in this life and that affect how you live your life today. And for that reason, it's it's important then that as this distinguishes is this distinguishes one thing from another then we follow greater principles and we be cautious in application of smaller principles that's what i'm sharing today now why is this important because when we are talking about um a person who has committed suicide we can agree the termination of one's life is sin why is that important? Because at the very end of the day, it is a violation of God's desire for your life. Even though God gives you free will concerning your life, he has a desire and a plan for you. And for that reason, the plan that he has allocated or given to you in your life is designed to, our responsibility is to submit our will, our desire, our inclinations, our plans to him, to follow his will for our lives. So without doubt. But the problem is one sin does not nullify salvation. One sin does not nullify salvation. We came out of the Christian culture in which all of us were taught or we were, we were, we were ex it was explained to us for many people that as soon as you sin and you walk out of the road and you're hit by a car and you die immediately, you are going to go to hell. If you have a dirty thought in your head between your house and the church and just 15 minutes out of your driveway getting to the church and something happens to you and you hadn't repented, you're going straight to hell. So we come out of very religious culture. We come out of a culture bound by the law where we believe that the law is all in all and the law of God is, God is a gavel, a judge holding a gavel, waiting to smite you 
by your sin. And for that reason, our mindset has, has come out of a culture where religion, where, where the law, legalism has been the abiding principle. A lot of people believe then if the last act on earth you did is a sin, then your entire salvation is forfeit and you've nullified and you're going straight to hell. Now, the principle of God is not that because if I'm saved, I'm saved not by works, but I'm saved by faith. So it's not what I do that makes me saved. It's my faith in Christ. And that salvation is not wiped out the very minute I do sin the next time because it nullifies salvation entirely. So if my last act on earth is sin in the actions of even self-harm, in the actions of what I'm doing to myself, that does not nullify salvation. That does not mean I am going to hell. Now, in the conversation that I had with, with um, this father figure, this this um, person who was mentoring in me and teaching me, they said to me something very interesting and it made me quite sad. They said to me, but we don't want to tell people this because it looks like we are encouraging it. Now, what that does is it's shifting accountability out of the church. The church needs to take responsibility for what it's doing. We need to take responsibility for mentoring the next generation. We need to take responsibility for developing the next generation. What does that mean? It is a responsibility of the church to look at issues such as mental wellness. It is the responsibility of the church to deal with issues such as um, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, loneliness. A lot of people, loneliness is one of the greatest pandemics of our time. But these conversations are needed when the church embraces these conversations and says it's important that we start building healthy people. Now, I'm going to talk about, uh, have an entirely different conversation about why religion is not working, why Christianity is not working, and why many people are struggling to be faithful Christians, why people are struggling to grow in the faith, and, and why is it that we have so many of these things, divorce, uh, depression, anxiety, and so forth, in our generation. I think that conversation is needed. And I believe that it's a, it's, it's a responsibility again of the church because there's certain things we didn't teach. There's certain things we didn't instill. And that's the reason why a lot of people are struggling um, with these things. But in spite of all of that, it is then our responsibility as a church to begin to develop mindsets, uh, develop conversations that help people navigate difficult moments and places of their life. I've heard such irresponsible management of certain truths, and this is one of those truths. You don't go to hell because you've committed suicide, but it's important that you find help. It's important that we create environments that sustain help. And when I'm talking about help, I'm talking about both um, Clinical health, because clinical health has a place in it, but I'm also talking about spiritual health. I am, um, I've been through so much in ministry and in over 20 years of ministry exposure and function, one thing I've learned is that depression is a demonic system. Depression is a demonic system. You can have the spirit of depression cast out of you. You can have all of that stuff done in your life. You can have lon loneliness uh, even as, a, as, an, uh, as an ideal dealt with. Why is that important? Because even though there is general loneliness, I'm alone, I don't have anybody to relate with, and that's a relational problem, okay? So that's a clinical issue. We can actually build a network of connections and relationships that help address issues of loneliness. But certain people are lonely, even if people are around and they are blessing you and they are around you, they are showing you love, you feel a sense of sadness and alone. And, and, and that is a demonic system. Why is that important? We go back to scripture and we have a conversation on the on soul. And scripture says that a spirit from God would come to torment him and worship was the system that would remove it. Not everything is clinical. I have seen depression cast out of people. I've seen anxiety cast out of people. I've seen cer certain things that torment people, demonic spirits and entities that are afflicting people cast out and people are delivered from it. So the mindset then is, it is our responsibility as a church, number one, to develop gifting and to develop abilities and capabilities that can address things like such as suicidal thoughts. I know what suicidal thoughts are like. I struggled with them for a long time. And, and looking at my life now, I always say, I wish God had told me in the struggle that I was, I wish he had told me that my life was going to be this good, that I was going to be this happy. And I wish that God had, had given me this knowledge then. I wish someone had come to me and say, you know what, life is going to be good. You know, and at that time I was alone, I was depressed, I was suicidal, I was in a bad space and God pulled me out. And here I am looking at my life, I've got three beautiful kids. I've got this incredible wife and, and, and this incredible system of people around me. I've been intentional about building my relationships and the people that are around my life. And I am 
so happy. I'm, I mean, I was talking to a friend yesterday. We were having lunch and I said to him, I have never been this happy in my life. And, and I wish God had told me then in the darkness of my life, um, God says to Isaiah, I, I called you in the furnace of affliction, in that place that I was in. I wish someone had told me it's going to be amazing. It's going to be good. And so if you are thinking about it and you're struggling with suicidal thoughts and you're struggling with all of this stuff, I wish you knew what God has in store for you. There's such an amazing journey and such an amazing destiny that God has for you. And in all of that, in all of that, I don't want to say find help. We are available to help. We are equipped to help. And it's our responsibility to, to teach you that. You're not fated for hell, but at the same time, life can be such an amazing gift. And, and that's the beauty of what God has called us for in this, in this assignment. God bless you.